Good morning, good afternoon uh, to all of you. Today, World Speech Day and World Values Day have joined forces to host a panel discussion to explore the issue of domestic violence as a part of the World Speech Day Women International Women's Day virtual event 2023. According to the United Nations, domestic violence or intimate partner violence can be defined as a pattern of behavior in any relationship that is used to gain or maintain power and control over an intimate partner. It can be physical, sexual, emotional, economic, or psychological actions or threats of actions that have an influence over another person. We have a brilliant panel brilliant offering panel. different perspectives on this matter. Today we have Rajendra Maharajan, who is the country coordinator for Right Here, Right Now, working in sexual and reproductive health and rights of young people in Nepal. We have Dr. Bettina Baobang Baidu, who is a South African medical doctor, debate coach, motivational speaker, and author currently pursuing a master's degree in public health. We have Carmen Martinez Vargas, who is a transdisciplinary scholar and author of Democratizing Participatory Research Pathways to Social Justice from the South. Of course, we have Simon Gibson, who is a writer, speech writer, and founder of World Speech Day. And last but not least, we have Charles Fowler, who is the Global Coordinator for World Values Day. In addition to being involved with two other UK-based NGOs, in addition to uh, World Values Day, these organizations also focus on values. I am Vino Pele. I, I am the Global Lead for World Speech Day Women and your moderator for today. I want to start off by giving Simon and Charles the floor to share why they think this topic aligns with the mission of their respective organizations. Charles? Uh, yes, I'll start. Uh, yes. Thank you very much indeed, Vina. Um, and welcome to everyone. Um, just to say very quickly, World Values Day, as, it na as its name may suggest, aims at increasing the uh, awareness and practice of value around the world. Um, and the World Values Day started as a campaign about eight years ago. And over time, we've become increasingly interested in looking at the big issues facing the world, which uh, challenge the uh, awareness and practice of values, which are challenges to our values, the you know, in inherent values, if you like, the intrinsic values, human values, whatever you like to term them, that we, we uh, overwhelmingly share around the world. Um, and we've been looking at um, big issues. With World Speech Day, we looked a few months ago at the refugee crisis, the global refugee crisis, um, we've also been looking recently, as well, that is, day at um, addiction, the addiction crisis around the world, at mental health crisis around the world, at war generally, at the issues to do with the environment and sustainability. Um, and so we're we're really pleased to um, join you all in looking at this particular extremely big and serious issue facing us all, at uh, which. Um, quite apart from all the pain and suffering, is clearly a, 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 a challenge to our values and, uh, and, and an invitation really for us to see how values can play a part in addressing these issues. And um, that's our point, that's our, our perspective, my perspective on, on, on this issue. Um, obviously, the perspective of others will be, will be rather different. Um, uh, over to you, Simon. Um, thanks, Thank you. Charles. Um, well, one of my, the uh, great pleasures of recent times for me has been <clears throat> watching uh, World Speech Day women grow and blossom, uh, and in particular the uh, vivid events that um, Bino hosts on uh, International Women's Day, um, which are a real highlight. Um, the reason Charles and I set up these uh, talks was to... Uh, review certain important and contemporary topics, but from a global perspective. Um, very often we felt that uh, these topics, these uh, subjects were being 
talked about, but also mainly from a, from a national or indeed even local level. And maybe there's something to be gained, maybe something to be learned from looking at things from a global perspective. So that was one of our <clears throat> uh, main reasons for setting them up. And the second reason was that we felt that um, very often uh, the things which are in plain sight, the things which uh, are often discussed in the media and uh, in conversations are actually often the least well understood. That, For the very reason that we talk about them, sometimes we don't know maybe the, the fuller facts, the, a better understanding. And so these uh, brief talks are aimed at kind of developing our understanding um, and, and, and bringing out issues which uh, I'm sure that uh, of you know fabulous range of speakers this morning will be able to to add to so uh i'm here uh as a witness as, as a listener and i'm really looking forward to uh to hearing what you will have to say and uh yeah i'm very very uh, grateful that you're all here today Thank you so much for that introduction, both Simon and Charles. I think it's it's good for us to see exactly how this feeds into our discussion today. So I think we're going to dive right in. Uh, we're starting with Rajendra. Rajendra, what do you believe is the extent of domestic abuse? And is there reliable data on the scale of domestic abuse around the world? Uh, thank you, Vino, for, for, for the question. I think the problem of domestic uh, intimate uh, partner abuse is uh, widespread and effect, uh, has been affecting millions of people around the world. So according to the World uh, Health Organization, uh, globally, uh, one in uh, three women uh, have experienced uh, either physical or sexual abuse by their intimate partners. Uh, so let me give an example of Nepal. Uh, the study was conducted in 2015, uh, and that study shows that uh, the prevalence is much higher, which is around 70% of women have experienced uh, either physical or sexual or uh, psychological uh, views by the partner and the study uh, also shows uh, uh, had shown us that the uh, the main cause of death and disability ha has been the region of this intimate partner violence in Nepal so the this the, the this is also the similar with around the world and the global uh, unfortunately, uh, the reliable data on the scales of, uh, of uh, violence uh, is uh, not available uh, uh, the way we want it. Uh, it. It might be because of many countries globally have uh, do not have a proper effective system to collect uh, and uh, collect data and report the such uh, cases. And also uh, the the survivors, especially women, uh, they are not empowered enough uh, to uh, to be there at the authorities to report such cases and uh, their experience they had uh, from their uh, part uh, partners. Uh, so it can be said that uh, the, so it can be concluded uh, with the uh, remarks that uh, the actual. Uh, abuse or violence or uh, incidents of uh, partner violence much uh, is likely much higher than uh, that has been reported. Okay, All right. And then what are your views on the most worrying trends, both nationally and globally for you? Uh, thank you again. So one of the uh, worrying thing uh, is, uh, is the unreporting of the cases. Uh, so but as I mentioned earlier, uh, omens, or especially omens and other survivals of intimate partner violence, uh, they they are not. Uh, being able to report cases. So it might be because of uh, stigma. It, it, it is associated with the same. It is also uh, associated with the fear of retaliations from the, uh, their partner. Uh, and it is also associated with the systems that uh, that uh, that are in place where the, they they are their survival friendly where they they have such spaces where they can uh, have confidential spaces to share their uh, or report those cases 
and second uh, is lack of resources and the support services uh, so in terms of resources uh, many countries including nepal they they have very limited resources allocated for uh, survival uh, and uh, their support so uh, in the support system also they had they lack uh, uh, shelter uh, most psychosocial support for the survivals they also uh, uh, need legal health support uh, well, especially the women in rural places like nepal where the, uh, they need uh, different kinds of support when they face such experience or they they uh, face abuse from the partner but uh, there there lacks such support system there lacks uh, the resources uh, for themselves to be there to report such cases and say other worrying thing is the access to finance for the women uh, and financial dependency to their intimate partner uh, especially women uh, in south asia uh, they are more depend, uh, dependent to their husbands for, for uh, finance or even they they want to buy small stuff uh, household stuff uh, they have to depend or ask their husband so that leads to increase in uh, violence uh, in the uh, family and also the harmful social norms and practices that uh, uh, we, we have been practicing for uh, uh, a long time uh, where we practicing the patriarchal uh, belief, patriarchal uh, uh, norms and values where we, uh, we have uh, uh, taught everyone that men are superior uh, or, and that's why women are, uh, do not require respect or they can be uh, abused. So that kind of belief that has been developed from generations uh, uh, that has that is very worrying uh, element for, for ending uh, uh, such violence. And also the legal protection system that the, uh, that are in countries, uh, the, they are also worrying because of the, there is lack of a protection system. There is lack of uh, uh, legal supporters uh, that can support uh, survivors, especially women, and uh, to, even though they, they they face risks from uh, such uh, supporters sometimes. So that so these are the few uh, areas. Or, or other things that we need to we that are worrying uh, to 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 challenge uh, intimate partner abuse and violence. Sure. Okay. So I'd like to move on to Bettina now. Bettina, why has abuse become so prevalent in society? What do you think are the main drivers of abuse? Thank you so much, Rina. You know, thank you for having me on this panel today. I think it's such an important discussion that we are having about domestic abuse. And um, as Simon mentioned, the conversation needs to evolve. And I think the more we speak about it, the more we allow for that evolution and finding gaps in what we don't know, what we need to research more on and how we can create a situation or a circumstance in which all women are protected. Um, so in terms of the drivers of abuse, and I always want to preface a discussion about drivers with the idea that even though we identify risk factors and things that make individuals prone to domestic abuse, it is not all inclusive. I think sometimes focusing on drivers makes individuals who don't identify with those risk factors less willing to report abuse because they don't think abuse can happen to them or should happen to them. So even though we're discussing drivers of abuse as a way to understand what we need to respond to in society, it's not all inclusive and anyone can be a victim of abuse in society, regardless of their circumstance and their situation. I think that's important to say from the get-go. I think it's also important within the conversation about domestic abuse to define the areas we're talking about. So domestic abuse is encompassing of interpersonal violence, um, interrelational violence between partners, but it also encompasses abuse towards children, abuse towards the elderly as well. Um, so any kind of abuse that happens in a domestic setting, we would consider to be domestic abuse and factors and driving factors towards abuse also need to look 
at other kind of relationships that happen. So relationships between parents and children and relationships between caregivers to elderly individuals in their family settings. So with that said then, you know, interrelational violence, interpersonal violence, especially amongst women and men is the most prevalent and factors and information that we have about drivers of abuse is more common in that area. And those drivers consist of, first of all, education. So it has been found that women completing specifically secondary education are less likely to experience abuse um, than women who haven't completed um, you know, their education. So socioeconomic standards as well. So women living in lower socioeconomic standards, being more prone to abuse and prone to domestic violence as well. Um, it's also been associated with substance abuse. So individuals who live in a house where somebody um, suffers from substance use disorder is more, are more likely to also be victims of domestic abuse. Um, another really, really important one is individuals who have witnessed violence growing up as well as previously have been victims of violence themselves. I think that's such an important one when we speak later about how do we react and respond to violence because we know that in circumstances where somebody has seen or witnessed violence as a child, our psychosocial services need to come in place in order for us to be able to prevent the kind of behavior from being you know, initiated or um, created again when they grow up or in their lifetime. Another really important element of it, as Rajendra also pointed out, is the dependency that individuals have. So the financial circumstances of women, do they have access to other economic opportunities? And that's a really important driver in terms of them staying in abusive circumstances um, and not being able to be free from those abusive circumstances. Um, and that's because domestic abuse is such a complex social phenomena that it's really difficult to um, have one type of solution that speaks to it holistically because of these wide range of driving factors that, um, you know, that lead to it and, and that influence it. But I think for the most part, those would be the kind of identified driving factors that are, um, you know, that are commonly spoken about in the literature. I think you touched on something that uh, we, we, we don't often focus on, the elderly, and that is something that's so important for us to consider and to have conversations about. But then what about social media and digital media and the impact mm -hmm. that has in terms of abuse? What can you say about that? Yes, I think it's a very dual conversation. And I think, you know, most large bases or institutions that are used by a lot of people will have mixed responses in terms of is it good or bad for um, domestic violence. So in the one instance, domestic violence and social media, social media has been useful in terms of creating awareness about what domestic violence is, creating awareness about solutions that women can have in being able to escape circumstances, NGOs that they can reach out to. So social media platform is being used by most people in the world, people spending large amounts of their time on social media platforms is a great place and a great space to create awareness, to have the conversation, the Me Too movement that really ignited conversations about domestic violence, about gender-based violence in our world and society. So on the one end, there have been really great positives from social media in terms of being used by activists and used by people to create awareness and to make individuals aware of solutions they can have um, to being or, or to escaping those circumstances. On the other end, Social media has also opened up other forms of domestic violence that are important to consider and that are important for us to move forward. It has made it easier, for example, for an individual to be stalked by an intimate partner. Um, so social media stalking that happens um, on those platforms being a new form of domestic violence that we need to consider made it easier for um, emotional violence and, and, and verbal abuse to occur towards individuals in the homes, which is harder to escape than leaving a physical environment because social media means that somebody can access you from you know, different places, even if they aren't directly next to you. And that has expanded the type of abuse that we can see um, from different places. But as Rajendra also spoke to, 
what we consider to be masculine, what we consider to be feminine. And even though social media has challenged those ideologies, in some instances, it can also reinforce what we think is masculinity. Um, in South Africa, we have a very, very popular saying called Indoda Mast, which means like, this is what we expect of a man. Um, and those kind of conversations that commonly happen, you know, reinforce ideas that the man needs to be the financial bearer and needs to look after a person, reinforces ideas of lesser culture where younger women are looking for older relationships in which abuse is also um, you know, found to be more prevalent and more common. So social media can also reinforce those kind of stereotypes and those um, ideologies that make violence more likely. Interestingly, you know, the, both the good and evil of social media shows us how values are interwoven even, even in how we use social media and the impacts of it as you, you know, gauging by what you, your answer right now. So this brings us to Carmen. Carmen, what do you, what sorts of abuse do you believe are most overlooked or are not recognized by most of us? Thank you. Thank you for that question and for the invitation. It's, it's a pleasure to be here today discussing with, with all of you. And it's been a pleasure to, to listen to my colleagues here today in the panel. Um, Centered, certainly, we can say that all type of abuse has been overlooked. <laughs> all of them, uh, all of them, from uh, physical to psychological to sexual and, and economic, that are often the one referred to. Um, I say this because, of course, you know, depending on the context, some of them are more prevalent than others. And certainly the physical and the sexual has been historically the ones that are more um, visible for international organizations. Um, but obviously I think there is a challenge to see the psychological and the economic in a more kind of long-term uh, perspective. Uh, because, um, as I said, the sexual and the physical is an action and it's an action that is taken and is like resolving that action. But the um, psychological and the economic, uh, it goes long term and there are implications that is something that Bettina was commenting on about intergenerational violence passing from one generation to another. And I think that is really key at the moment in terms of breaking uh, cycles of abuse in many, in many countries, besides the more visible or physical violence that, that we experience. Um, and I think, of course, um, this is connected to collectives in terms of intersectional profiles, which has been said by, by my colleagues. Um, because we tend to assume that gender violence is only against this kind of ideal um, uh, profile of a young woman with kids, small kids, right? And, and it's not, it's really not. And we forget about the intersections, um, like uh, we were mentioning about elderly uh, women, about LGBTQI plus uh, collectives. Um, and all these kind of intersections that situate these collectives uh, being more vulnerable to this kind of violence. Um, yeah, so I will, I will leave it there. Thank you, Carmen. Well, back to you, Rajendra. It, in terms of the work that you do and the exposure you have had, what sort of stories have you heard firsthand which brought home to you the seriousness of this problem or has demonstrated how abuse can be ignored or deliberately overlooked by those in power? Uh, thank you. So let me share uh, an incident that happened on 29th January, which is very recent, uh, when a, a, a man Ban, a named Banubika uh, said his wife and two years son uh, on fire uh, and uh, skipped and the, uh, and the authorities, especially the police, are still uh, uh, searching uh, this guy. So another incident happened in 2022, uh, uh, around November, where a woman uh, of his 27th uh, uh, 
so bond herself in front of uh, her ex fiance uh, with where the fiance uh, asks uh, this woman to broke the relations they have or the engagement they had so such incident is happening uh, in nepal and other countries uh, around the world uh, so that such incidents or such crucial or critical incidents has demonstrated the urgency of addressing uh, domestic abuse in Nepal and around the world. So it also shows the need for great support for survivors. So the, the, especially the woman uh, who burned herself uh, in front of her fiancé. So uh, she could have been saved uh, if she were provided with proper counseling on time uh, and count the provided counseling uh, with the sharing that the bre breaking up with the relation is is fine uh, she could uh, start new relationships or so she, 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 she could have uh, found better uh, men uh, or better person in future but that lack of that support system uh, within family, within community, and within the structure itself uh, uh, has uh, led to, to happen such incidents. And it's also crucial for authorities uh, and police makers uh, who, who need to take this issue very seriously and uh, effectively implement the policies and uh, uh, laws they already have in place. Like in Nepal, we have Domestic um, Violence Act 2019, uh, but it has not been, been implemented effectively. And uh, people have less aware of this uh, act in place. And they, they, are, they are not aware of what to do when uh, they personally experience uh, such incident. So uh, back in few few years back also, there, there was an incident of uh, uh, rape um, uh, of 16 years old by uh, her partner and it had uh, because the, the guy and their family has good relations with the uh, police local authorities and uh, it was uh, dismissed the case was dismissed uh, within the few days uh, and all the evidences of uh, rapes were uh, disappeared and the case is still on. Lots of NGOs uh, and civil society organizations raise voice uh, uh, to, to, uh, to challenge or to, to take that guy in custody. But that power, having relations with these authorities, uh, uh, make them easier uh, to, to dismiss those case. So the case is still on, but well, it is taking longer time and it has not been authorities and police has not been able to uh, capture that guy still he is still running around and uh, in the community and maybe uh, uh, taking uh, advantage of uh, another adults and girls so that issue that that seriousness had to be uh, taken care of by the authority authorities uh, also families and uh, community as a whole. Thank you, Rajendra. Um, Bettina, in terms of efforts to address domestic abuse, can you think of any real life examples of initiatives and can you offer evidence to support these strategies that have been put into place? Thank you so much. Um, and I think maybe I want to speak about this from the perspective of, of public health. Um, so um, working in the public health space and as a public health practitioner, I think some of the solutions that are really important and why public health is coming into the forefront in relation to domestic violence is the recognition that domestic violence, especially in South Africa, is a threat to the well-being of the lives of women. So in, two, in 2009, 59% of homicides that were, um, you know, that were um, inflicted on women were caused by an intimate partner. And that's a critical, critical number, which means more than one in two women um, that are dying by homicide are dying because of an intimate partner. And if we're going to talk about health and health in its most holistic definition being 
the well-being of an individual, both mentally, socially, and physically, then domestic violence is a critical threat to the um, health of individuals. And I say this because as we're talking um, on this issue of values and world values, um, um, world values initiatives, the health system needs to be a value-driven institution. It's values that shape what we think is important to respond to. It's values that shape what we prioritize in terms of resource allocation, what we prioritize in terms of initiatives. And we saw this with the HIV AIDS epidemic in South Africa, that when our values aligned with the need to respond to it, South Africa is one of the most robust um, you know, HIV AIDS response systems ever. Solutions are possible. And I think at a point where we think of something and make it too complex, and we think that solutions aren't possible, our values don't align. So I think first of all, when we're looking at solutions, we need to realign and reorientate all our systems outside of public health towards understanding that responding to domestic violence and gender-based violence is essential, and that every system in society needs to be responding to it. The education system, the public health system, all need to have this as a forefront of their solutions. With that said then, I think public health is so essential because victims of violence, especially physical violence, practitioners are the first point of call in most instances that individuals will come to, um, whether or not you know, they faced um, sexual abuse and they want to receive services for that sexual abuse or whether or not we're physically harmed and they're there for those reasons. If practitioners are not well equipped to be able to refer patients to the correct places, to be able to start these conversations, we lead to a situation where we're going to just be reinforcing this violence over and over again. So as a first line response, we need to ensure that our public health systems are configurated towards um, domestic violence and towards ensuring this. And the World Health Organization has an entire policy brief on how governments can reorganize their public health systems to be responsive to domestic violence and recognizes the role of public health in that response. Second of all, I think we need to recognize that domestic violence is so tied to issues we've been speaking about, so tied to mental health services, which are a catastrophe in the African health system, which are not focused on and receive almost no funding. We can't respond to domestic violence if people can't get treatment for trauma they've experienced as children, if people can't get treatment for substance use disorders, if people can't get treatment for depression. None of that can happen until we're able Able to really invest and prioritize mental health services as a necessity within this nation. That's how we start to challenge the intergenerational causes of violence at a point where we can give people access to those resources and abilities. And lastly, I think we need to look into these ideas of shelters and places that individuals who have been affected by violence go to. If we look at the history of domestic shelters in South Africa, it's really, um, it's, it's very complex and also quite sad because these um, shelters have received such little support and these shelters are an important place for women to go to to receive access to financial resources and ability to break out of those systems and we need to reinvest again in shelters reinvest again in these places of refuge but all of this ties into creating a system that prioritizes and allocates resources towards those solutions I think that's how we can start moving forward um, in addressing domestic violence. I think you've given us such incredible solutions to this issue, but the fact that domestic violence is so prevalent, it's, it's, it's because there are still obstacles. What are some of the obstacles that you, that you can pinpoint? Yes, I think those obstacles also speak to what I was mentioning prior. So the obstacles in relation to our mental health services, the obstacles in relation to people's ability to access shelter and access, um, you know, a reprieve from violence itself. Because the issue with domestic violence is that one in five women have already experienced domestic violence or are in a circumstance where violence is happening. It's the recurring nature of violence that we also need to speak into to prevent individuals who are already facing violence from facing future violence. And in a situation where women 
aren't economically independent, it's very difficult for them in these intimate partner relationships to find other alternatives or to be able to leave. So when we are able to reconstruct and look at our domestic shelters, what can they offer women? What kind of options can they give women? Can we reorientate them away from just being about women coming and staying for a period of time and leaving again to a system in which they're actively being rehabilitated, actively being given skills and the ability to break out of that situation. And I think overall, in terms of what's been preventing us from moving forward, I think it's our cultural understandings as well, and the ways in which we relate to each other. I think we will always come back to conversations about our constructs of gender, our constructs of masculinity, and needing to speak into that, needing men to really confront their vision, their ideas of what masculinity is, and how then we are able to break out of that and break out of those cycles. Absolutely. Carmen, what is your view on this? What are the biggest obstacles in your view to tackling domestic abuse? Um, I completely agree with uh, Bettina. Um, I guess in the in the um, academy, we, we cannot agree on this, right? So <laughs> depending on the different disciplines, you know, one will say one aspect and, and the other will say um, another. And I guess uh, perhaps something um, that is overlooked is this kind of systematic and more structural aspect of domestic abuse and gender-based violence in the sense that it's a crisis of values of our society um, and is, um, you know, Victorian patriarchal values that has been fostered and reshaped uh, within neoliberal societies and therefore, you know, continue to be part of how or uh, gender relations work within societies. And especially here, referring Western societies and societies that are somehow uh, following a kind of model of being a, a human being and being a collective uh, society. So I think for me, it's quite important uh, to highlight this uh, link uh, between the past and the present in the formation of these uh, values. So we understand that these dynamics are not coming out of the blue, but they have been formed and uh, reshaped uh, by economic values in the last uh, centuries. And the issue with the economic values is that because of um, neoliberal values, it exacerbated the position uh, of women within the, the society. And we have come to a point in where uh, we, we can reclaim um, as women economic freedoms, but somehow we get stuck uh, within power relations. And therefore, you know, we see consequences or the outcomes of these dynamics as domestic abuse and gender-based violence. So I think for me, um, and coming back to the discussion and the points at the beginning, one of the biggest obstacles is to not recognize the values that we use to function as society and they are there because many people believe that we are not normative in the way that we behave, that we are not, uh, or we are ethically driven and these ethics, um, or moral behaviors are somehow magically situated for the good. And unfortunately, we see throughout history that good intentions is never enough. And our values are producing consequences that are oppressing other collectives and other communities unintentionally. And therefore, we need a real critique of what uh, neoliberal and mother values are and how they are impacting uh, domestic abuse and gender-based violence. Okay. So, Rajendra, it's a well-known fact that national and international governments and agencies play a pivotal role in addressing abuse. How can you comment on this? Well, what do you believe that the, that national and, and international governments and agencies are doing to address this issue? 
Yeah, I agree with uh, previous panelists uh, about changing uh, gender norms um, and access to finance. So uh, these are the two important key factors that needs to be addressed uh, and, to, uh, and also the root cause of domestic abuse that has been happening. So government or uh, international NGOs and NGOs. Um, so this needs to work collectively to address those root causes and identify those root causes. So that can be different from a country to country. And within the country, it can be different from a context to context, one community from other com community. So they need, we need to come together and we need to create a core cohesiveness and create a partnership between government and uh, uh, organizations uh, at different levels that can start from local uh, national and international level uh, to understand or identify those key uh, root cause of domestic and intimate partner violence and uh, design and develop uh, uh, programs and policies that can address uh, those those root cause. Uh, so there can, it can be done by uh, legis legislative reforms. So in different countries uh, now uh, they have been this, uh, abide with different international commitments to in gender-based violence and independent partners. Uh, many countries have uh, have the developed policies and programs and acts, but uh, in terms of uh, implementation, it has there is there has been some lacks uh, in implementation. So government or international organizations, agencies or NGOs can provide technical support for government where they lack some understanding on dealing those issues, then they can come together to, to reform such policy and programs. Uh, the, we can also, as an organization agencies, we can uh, increase the awareness raising campaigns uh, uh, at online and offline spaces. So at this digital age, there has been we can use of different uh, increase awareness. So in terms of Nepal, we have 70% uh, uh, internet penetration in uh, Nepal, almost 90% uh, uses a smartphone. So uh, we can use such uh, uh, technologies to, to uh, uh, increase awareness. Uh, so uh, we can so uh, there can be uh, we can initiate a hotline service in partnership with the government where uh, uh, survival can uh, only give uh, or connect uh, with free of cost uh, to, to to report the cases and uh, there is uh, uh, providing with support system um, uh, including shelter uh, counseling uh, and legal aid so uh, we can also provide some support service support uh, where we can, uh, so one of the best examples in Nepal is Safe Houses, uh, so initiated by different organizations uh, led by a uh, woman, woman department. And uh, in that Safe Houses, it is supported by different organizations like UNICEF, WHO, and in that spaces, uh, survival can, survivals can uh, stay there as long as they, they, they feel safe. And they, they also provide the legal aid support and counseling support there. So such support system also can be built by agencies like us. And we can also provide support uh, on uh, providing capacity, strengthening to the uh, survival of general public uh, as a whole, and also to the, the service providers uh, like female health workers, uh, health uh, legal aid, uh, providers where we can strengthen the capacity to uh, to un to increase their understanding uh, about the abuse and how they can provide support uh, uh, for for the survivors. So uh, then finally we can also uh, so as I mentioned earlier we do not have reliable sources. Uh, to scale uh, the domestic violence and abuse. So as agencies, we can also co come up uh, to support in data collections, research uh, to identify the actual uh, scenario in terms of abuse and uh, generate evidences for, for government uh, to advocate and support government uh, to, to challenge and to work uh, against the partner abuse. 
So I think we can agree that national and international governments and agencies play a critical role in terms of legislation, policies, programs, and financial and infrastructural support. But Carmen, what do you think we as individuals can do to, to address this, this issue? Thank you for, for that question. And I think it's a tricky question, right? Because here we are assuming that as individuals, we have power, you know, to fight against the structures. And um, it's not that I disagree with agency and, and the point of, um, you know, seeing the, the potential of having some um, agentic actions. But I think we need to be conscious that um, here we're dealing with a structural issue. So this is kind of a collective uh, responsibility that we need to carry. And um, and when we carry this responsibility, we have to be careful not to re-victimize the victims, uh, telling them as individuals that they have to, you know, help to fix the, the, the problem because they were the victims or because they so feel strong about, you know, fighting uh, those things. And I think that's why it's a, it's a tricky question. Um, but besides that, what we see is that obviously when structures and institutions are failing us, um, the only way that we can uh, prompt some change is through uh, grassroots movements and and that's what we've been seeing right like uh, different movements different um, uh, non-for-profit organizations you know trying to push the agendas and lobby uh, to make this a priority so it becomes institutionalized um, in a way that is effective because I think at this point we we have it somehow institutionalized uh, the issue but but it's not effective yet and um, the complexity in which it's represented in the practices of different societies is really complex and therefore it's not being tackled in in the different ways that need to be done so I think at the individual level we have to of course you know be careful not to the re victimize victims about fighting against gender-based violence but for those who were privileged enough uh, like for instance us to have the resources and the abilities to access uh, these resources um, we can somehow you know be uh, part of this uh, push and support of organizations and this uh, tackles any gender any uh, class any kind of collective uh, but yeah we have to understand again that this is a, a structural issue and i think as such um we have to um somehow do not um put I mean, we are resolving um, intergenerational issues and uh, we need, you know, generations and education and resources to deal with this in the in the long term. Of course, you know, we have the agency and the localities and the uh, context in which we operate. But we have to also see this in a bigger picture, um, that this is something like sustainability in the long term in terms of gen gender-based violence. And I think we, we cannot underestimate the power we have as individuals and as citizens. Uh, I can give you two examples. World Speech Day Women, uh, it was in 2020, we had a digital literacy campaign during the 16 days of activism. And in, in an effort to protect you know, survivors and victims of gender-based violence, we didn't feature any of them. But instead, we have a, a, a very wide WSD community supported mainly by the university students and they stood up as advocates offering digital literacy tools to combat online violence and I think that's one example another example here in South Africa was in 2018 we had the global uh, citizen campaign and festival 
And that campaign gave us as South African citizens an opportunity to uh, participate in actions that were directed at various governments to change policy and legislation and so on by taking um, taking action online through various pledges. So, you know, it's, it, the, the opportunities are actually at hand for us to get involved and to speak up in whatever small way. We don't have to be, do big things. It's just, you know, small actions can take us a long way. So this brings me to uh, Rajendra again. Um, Rajendra. What areas do you think we, we most urgently need to change in terms of uh, changing attitudes or we, uh, towards abuse? And thank you for the question. Uh, again, uh, there are different and several areas uh, uh, towards uh, where attitudes towards domestic abuse uh, uh, needs to be changed. So as Carmen mentioned about back victim blaming so we have attitudes of blaming victims itself for uh, for the, the incident that had happened to them so everyone has to understand that it is not there uh, it is not the uh, uh, they wanted to have that incident to happen and they are not responsible for, for that abuse that had happened to them. So we need to change that attitude to blaming victims itself. So I can still remember my mother's school uh, blaming my sister uh, when she had uh, uh, a fight with her husband uh, a few years back. So that that attitudes where uh, we the, uh, blame victim itself has to be changed. And also, the, the, what we have been discussing the gender roles and stereotypes uh, for, uh, since the beginning of this uh, discussions, where we need to, to understand the power relationship uh, within the community, within the uh, nations, and we need to challenge that. And we need to change the attitudes where we uh, we we feel that men are superior and women uh, uh, are not uh, women should not be given priority in decision making process. So. Uh, so we, we can adapt gender transformative approach that has been practiced in different countries where we understand power relations and do different uh, uh, transformative approach. We need to understand the inclusivity and intersectionality approach where uh, we challenge that gender norms and stereotypes and uh, takes actions uh, against uh, uh, them. Uh, so we also have we as a people also have attitudes of normalizing uh, uh, abuse and uh, violence and uh, especially to, uh, I can take the examples of Nepal and South Asia where uh, the women are taught by the elders uh, uh, saying that uh, husbands are like God and uh, you you need to you must tolerate any kinds of abuse or violence that happen. Uh, to uh, to you, uh, and uh, you should not take any actions against your husband because he, he that person is like God. And there is a special word in Sanskrit that use pati parmeswara, which means husband or God. So that kind of uh, uh, the the lessons that has that kind of norms that has been practiced uh, in countries or, or communities uh, in individuals. Uh, that attitudes needs to be uh, challenged and changed uh, by the individual itself. Uh, but, and also the law enforcement, uh, where but we, we, we can feel that there is lack of political will, will of the uh, policy makers and the law, inf uh, the authorities where they want to challenge or they want to take actions on, on uh, uh, ending those such uh, violence. So to, to we need to work together to increase political will of the, those uh, that are in the decision making uh, table. Uh, we need to challenge that there needs to be uh, uh, women in the decision making table. There needs to be young people, there needs to be LGBTIQ community uh, in the decision making table to share their own story and uh, uh, demand uh, what they need uh, to, to in, uh, abuse uh, and violence they have been uh, facing uh, for a long time. 
I think uh, Rajendra, it's, it's, it's very encouraging to see the younger generation uh, challenging what we saw as normal, especially not necessarily with my generation, but the older generation. The example that you used you know, about not challenging the husband or accepting blame when something goes wrong. Uh, it was so much, you know, the, the norm. I think many of us would never have questioned that growing up, but we, we know differently now. And I think it, it's very, very uh, encouraging to see that for the younger generation, they, uh, they challenge all of this, they challenge these norms. So uh, this brings us close to the end of our, uh, of our panel discussion. And I'd like to give Simon and Charles an opportunity to reflect on the discussion and to comment. Uh, let's start with Charles. Thank you. Thank you, Vina. Um, I think this has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much. Um, often it's, it's, it's uh, uh, tempting to admire the discussion and, and, uh, uh, and feel even more overwhelmed after listening to it by, by the, uh, the scale of the problem. Um, but I think it's probably no, no surprise to us that the problem is very, very complex deeply rooted in, in society, all our societies around the world. Um, and it's easy to, um, you know, in a way, give up and think, well, what can we do to help? However, uh, so many things are being done on the ground, and, and we've heard quite a lot of them from all the speakers. Uh, thank you so much for, for sharing what you've been doing and your, your analysis of what needs to be done. Um, I think the, the takeaway I have from this is that um, structural changes are needed but structural changes need to be prompted by and accompanied by a change in attitudes in our societies because governments um, will respond, only respond really, um, one has to say, to the pressure, to the opinion, to the attitudes of the people whom either elect them or at least <laughs> to whom, whom uh, they are in some way responsible to, depending on the, the structure of the government and the structure of the, the, the country. Um, and uh, I thought it's really heartening to hear that that there are things we can do. And I think, as ever, technology brings big problems with it, and in some ways has exacerbated this particular one, but also uh, may provide some help towards um, resolving, or at least addressing, not resolving, sadly, probably for, for a long, long time, but addressing uh, the, the, the problem by giving us a, a mechanism for uh, changing generally public attitudes uh, gradually over time. Um, and hopefully this, um, this particular discussion is one way that we can help do that, do just that. So thank you so much. I'm, I'm really, really um, happy to have heard this um, very, very powerful and useful discussion. And, and I found it very moving. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charles. Simon? We can't hear you, Simon. I think. It would help if the host turned his, his microphone on, of course. Um, <laughs> I, I think the the uh, the first thing uh, that comes to mind really is that there's so much to think about and to talk about uh, and to, to take away and think about and, and, and reflect on. So uh, I, I haven't got an in, enormous number of immediate remarks to make. Um, it seems to me, however, that there are a number of things which are in common and that all of you comment about, such as uh, intergenerational violence and socio-economic conditions which drive so much of domestic abuse, and, and that's understandable. But also um, <clears throat> the fact that context is everything, um, and, and it's a danger to approach things um, from a, a sort of uh, generalization where, where context and individual circumstances are, are the most important. Um, and those change culturally. Um, and we've seen that in, in various different speakers. Um, and the thing that occurred to me most when I was listening uh, to you was that um, we, we define ourselves through our relationships. Uh, relationships give us a sense of self and many of these problems it seems to me come out of that notion of self and and, and when we feel it either threatened or or in somehow endangered um and i, I think 
therefore that it um it is a matter of um raising this on a, on, a, on a sort of societal level that we need to talk about things we need to speak about them to raise uh, them and to to give uh, people confidence to approach and care about it um and uh, therefore speaking out and talking about these subjects is an extremely important part of mending them uh, that it isn't going to be however effective institutions or governments or even indeed even the law that really changes things but social attitudes social values which uh, will um, also things and um, just as Bettina mentioned the change in the attitudes towards AIDS in South Africa that was the societal change because people understood more people taught more and people started to care more and uh, therefore I think uh, uh, that's what I will take away from this to think about how we can spread conversations about this subject and really um, do so from a value from a point of view that we can make a difference even just by sharing our thoughts. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Simon. I think it was a wonderful way for you and for Charles to uh, to bring this, this, this discussion to a conclusion. But I would like to, uh, as, as World Speech Day Women is a United Nations Women Generation Equality Commitment Maker, I'd like to conclude by mentioning the United Nations Women's International Women's Day 2023 theme, which is digital innovation and technology for gender equality. So whilst our discussion had covered various subjects of, um, of domestic violence, I think one of the things that it did reinforce is how essential it is to bridge the digital uh, gender divide with respect to eliminating the deficits in the production, availability and accessibility of data, evidence and stats on, on, on gender-based violence, so that proper legislation, policies and programs to address violence in women and girls are developed and implemented. This will also aid in increased awareness, increased awareness of and access to coordinated survivor-centered services. And in this vein, I would like to thank all of you for your contribution today. Uh, I'd like to thank Charles Fowler and Simon Gibson for the opportunity to collaborate and as such strengthen our efforts to advocate for the purposes of promoting gender equality and working towards a better world. But very importantly, and well, you know, last but certainly not least, I want to thank Rajendra Mahajan, um, uh, Bettina Baobeng Baidu, and Carmen Martinez Vargas uh, for your contribution today. Uh, I think you have brought you. unique perspectives uh, geographically and in terms of your expertise. So thank you all once again. <laughs>